Fine. Well, thanks so much for coming out today. There's, there's good competition in this slot, so I probably shouldn't have mentioned that because you might have a look, see who else is on at the same time and realise there's a better room you could be in. But Kevlin's all the way at the top and you won't get there in time, so you're going to have to stay here now. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. This is really a nice thrill for me because um, it's only my second in-person conference since the happening. Um, and it's been, this is probably the first one where I've actually felt comfortable enough to actually enjoy myself. And I've had some great conversations with, uh, with many of you uh, yesterday and looking forward to a more relaxed time once my talk is done. It's the first time I've given this talk in public. I did it in my hotel room by myself, talking often to like a fake attendees shaped in the form of towels and things. So um, hopefully you'll forgive any uh, slight missteps here and there. But I'm, I should, I'm, quite, this is, I'm very happy with this talk, actually. So I'm, I'm going to back. No, this is a good talk, right? And you'll be applauding at the end. That's what I'm thinking internally. But we're not, we're going to hear talking a little bit about the meaning of words. Now, some of you might know me for such things as microservices. Uh, that is indeed a lot of my day job. And today's talk is sort of microservices adjacent in as much as it's about a topic which often interests us when we're looking at any discussion around communication in a service-based architecture, of which microservices are just one type. I spend a lot of my time talking about boxes. Boxes and, very importantly, arrows. Right? The arrows are kind of vital in the whole boxes and arrows story. Sometimes I'm talking about how big boxes should be, or, indeed, how small boxes should be. In other situations, we are discussing what should be in a box, how many things should be in a box. I do especially enjoy talking about the shape of the box, and of course I have my own personal view, which of course is the correct view, which is that all boxes should in fact be hexagons. But today's talk is actually about the arrows, the arrows between these lovely, lovely boxes. This, my friends, is the life of an architect. How glamorous. It's a simple microservice architecture, just to, because some of you probably want to hear a little bit of microservice stuff. Um, and I always like to be very clear about what these diagrams represent, because I think understanding what I'm trying to share helps you get the best out of it and make sure we're talking about the same things. This is a little microservice architecture, it's a logical architecture diagram. And I show arrows here between these services. So this arrow here is what I use to denote a logical dependency. So the arrow here from returns to shipping defines the direction of a logical dependency. And specifically what we mean here is that the returns microservice depends on some functionality which is provided to it by the shipping microservice. I think it's a mistake with the service architecture to think in terms of, oh, I'm accessing data. I think more generically, the shipping microservice has some functionality it implements, and it decides to expose some of that functionality over network endpoints, which other services can then consume. And so this arrow says the return. So do with part of its job, I need to rely on things that the shipping microservice provides to me. This is kind of the acceptable face of coupling in the context of a microservice architecture. And I've referred to this typically as domain coupling, quite a loose or weak form of coupling in general, well, when compared to the others. So when we start talking about how to implement these interactions, the most common question I then get, and this is going back for many, many years now, is should this integration be synchronous or asynchronous? That's what I get. And I, and I actually think this distinction is not very useful and we'll get into why. That's really what the whole talk is about, that this distinction isn't one that gives us any ability to talk reasonably about what we want out of a system. I typically instead try and start the conversation talking about the different styles of interaction that we might have between two microservices. And broadly speaking, I've broken the, word that, the world down into request response oriented communication and event-driven communication. And again, this being a talk about meaning, I will now explain what I mean by these terms, just so there's no confusion. Request response oriented communication is probably the form of communication that many of you are most familiar with. 
So in this case, we've got a microservice. In this case, it's the returns microservice, which is acting as the consumer. It wants to consume functionality provided by another microservice. To do so in a request response oriented fashion, it sends a request. So in this case here, I'm going to another microservice and saying, hi, look, I need a shipping label. We need to return this package for a customer. I don't know how to generate return labels, but you do. The shipping microservice looks at the weight of the package you're trying to send, the location you're trying to send that to. And it generates you a label and it gives you a PDF maybe in the response that you can then use. Some people would refer to this in terms, instead of request response, I'll just say request driven. I like to point out that you always do want some kind of response even if it's just to know, did the thing work? But often because we need the response to do something else with that information, or because we've got you know, a chain of causality that we need to deal with. Other people will talk about commands. You can see a request as being a synonym, an alternative name for a command. I prefer the word request, because request is slightly weaker, which I think is important. When I send a request to something, the thing I'm sending a request to gets to say no. When I call something a command, it feels much more forceful. Do this. Do it. Do it. For me, these things are much more like a request to my son to clean up his room. It would be nice if it happened, but I'm not going to be surprised if it doesn't. So I would prefer request response, but I understand. Think command, if you're using that terminology, is kind of similar to a request here. So the, the returns microservice consumes the functionality of the shipping microservice. We move into the world of event driven, and this is quite different. Here we've inverted things. With request response, it's the consumer that initiates the interaction. I need to do something. Can you help me, please? With event-driven communication, we have an inversion. The consumers in this interaction don't initiate the interaction. They react to things happening in the system. So here we've got a microservice called inventory, and this manages the stock in our system. And it alerts us to a very important piece of information, and that is that we've just received 10,000 copies of Justin Bieber's greatest hits. Okay. This is vital information. Now, the way I describe an event, just to, you know, another way of thinking of an event here, is to think of it as a fact. Something has happened, and it's an important enough fact that I want to let the world know. So I communicate that fact, but I don't send a fact to anybody. It's more like putting up on a notice board, and then interesting parties can decide if they care about that fact. So in this example, we have two different microservices, which both care about this fact, but might do very different things with this information. The promotions microservice, for example, is responsible for automatically discounting our products based on stock volumes. So if we've got more than, say, 5,000 items in stock, it will automatically take 20% off the recommended retail price. The wish list, on the other hand, notifies people when items that they put on their wish list are now available in stock. One event, two very different outcomes. So in this context, these microservices on the right-hand side, promotion and wish list, are the consumers. We see a kind of interesting inversion. And these interaction styles are very different. Request response feels very familiar to us. Event-driven is very nicely loosely coupled, but has some additional complexity when trying to confirm things like, did anything actually happen? I'm a big fan of event-driven interactions because of that loose coupling nature. So this is to set the scene of how I tend to approach the world of inter-process communication. This tends to be where my head goes to first. I would say the majority of non-trivial microservice architectures that I've ever worked on will end up having a mix of these styles of interaction. There will be things that you want to do within your system that just fit one of those styles of communication really neatly. And you'll annoyingly have a lot of types of interactions that could be modeled in either way. And this is the beautiful bounty of our industry. There's always 100 different answers uh, to any given question. So then the interesting question is, well, what's my problem with synchronous versus asynchronous? Well, traditionally, I would sort of talk about synchronous and asynchronous here. Request response versus event driven here, and then talk about how they are related to each other. And as we'll see, you know, we, we think of request response traditionally as being very synchronous in nature, um, but in fact, it can also be asynchronous. We'll see how one way in which we can make an asynchronous interaction around request response for some value of the word asynchronous, and as we'll see later, 
the, the word asynchronous actually has no value. Um, uh, but event-driven interactions we always think of as being asynchronous in nature because the things reacting to the event are based on the nature of the interaction, deciding what they do, when they do it, if they feel like it. Right? And so I often found this kind of way of thinking of the world quite useful because rather than, say, picking a technology and then working out from that technology what I could do with it, instead I start by thinking about the style of interaction I want and then using that to pick which technology I want based on other factors in my environment. However, I've stopped doing this a little bit, partly because I've come to the realization there is no consistent definition of what asynchronous actually means. And I was sort of inspired to do this talk partly by a post by Pat Helland. So this is actually from Pat Helland's um, newsletter, which is very, it's, it's a very sporadic posting, but Pat Helland's a pretty smart guy. And in this post, he makes the argument that we should stop using the word the term eventual consistency, because we use consistency, the term consistency, in two very closely associated contexts, but those words have very different meanings. When we think about consistency in the context of eventual consistency, we're thinking about can two or three or four replicas see the same data at the same time? That's one of our main concerns. But then we have the term consistency in the context of an ACID database transaction, and it means something completely different. I mean, if you look at the definition of what consistency means, I'll leave that as an exercise to, to all of you, it means something very weird. And his argument is, well, actually, that's actually got mathematical properties and, you know, formal thinking behind it. Maybe we should come up with a new term for eventual consistency, and he suggests eventual convergence, which I think is a better term and is a term I'll be using going forward. Now, unfortunately, I'm not as smart as Pat. So Pat in this post says, here's a problem, here's a potential solution. This talk largely is about me going, yeah, it's a problem. I don't yet have the solution, but maybe you can help me with that a bit later on. So around this sort of time, I was thinking about this problem with this issue, with this term asynchronous, what does it mean? I talk to different people, I get very different views. So I did what any smart, rational human being would do, and that is reach out to Twitter for some well-thought-through advice and guidance. Remarkably, I got some kind of useful information. So from that point of view, you know, this might be quite shocking, right? So I'm going to run through some of the responses I got, and this gives you a sense of the different viewpoints on what asynchronous communication means to a variety of different people. So one of the first responses I got was from an old colleague of mine, Darren Hobbs. Uh, and Darren said, well, to him, asynchronous communication is sending an email versus having a phone call. Okay? And there, were, there were variations on all of these themes. I thought we'd we'll cherry pick the tweets that most fit these different ideas. Now, this, the problem is when we see a definition like this, we immediately start making assumptions that asynchronous communication will therefore somehow be slower than synchronous communication, which is, is not the case because the speed, the throughput, the latency of a system is based on a number of factors. And the fastest, lowest latency systems I've ever worked on absolutely rely on asynchronous communication. So this idea of slow email, fast phone call, doesn't quite line up. But there is something about this distinction that is interesting. So this was sort of rolling around in my head. And I thought, well, while this Twitter thread was going on, and you know, obviously there were certain conversations being had that I made heavy use of the mute button on, um, I thought, well, let's look elsewhere for where people have put time, energy, and work into trying to define these terms. And I come across the reactive manifesto. I say come across it. This is one of my favorite punching bags. It's always good to see where smart people have decided to get together and work together and try and define terms, putting their head above the parapet. And I thought I would reward that work. And there's a lot of great stuff in the reactive manifesto. I don't agree with a lot of it, and that's OK. But because they... They put their head above the parapet. I think it's only fair to take pot shots at them for things I don't agree with and cherry pick things that I can poke fun of. So I see this with lots of love for the people that wrote it. I do know some of them. There is some good stuff in here, as I say, but there are also some things that just, to me, don't make any sense. The later versions of the Active Manifesto try to do a better job of defining terms, which is good. So I go and took a look, I went to have a look at their definition of the term asynchronous. They start off, of course, in, in, in time-honored fashion, talking about what the Oxford English Dictionary thinks about asynchronous. 
And they say the Oxford English Dictionary defines asynchronous as not existing or occurring at the same time. Now, interestingly, the Oxford English Dictionary has multiple meanings for words, as something we'll come back to a bit later on. They have an explicit meaning for the term asynchronous in the context of computer-based systems, and that is not what this definition is. So they picked the wrong meaning for the word, but that's fine, we'll move on. The next thing they say is in the context of this manifesto, we mean that the processing of a request occurs at an arbitrary point in time, sometime after it has been transmitted from the client to the server. That's what they mean by asynchronous. And I'm thinking, what does that mean? Let's go through it again. The processing of the request occurs at an arbitrary time, sometime after it has been transmitted from the client to the server. And I'm thinking, what, as opposed to processing the request before it's been sent? How would that work? It's like some kind of Doctor Who stuff going on here. Do they think that other types of protocol, we, or we've got instantaneous communication? Look, there are two truths about distributed systems. One, it takes time for stuff to get to, from point A to point B. And two, sometimes point B isn't there. That's all distributed systems. The one thing we know is time is a thing, right? So, of course, I have to send something, and then it gets processed. This meaning isn't really, mean, isn't really helpful. But there's some other stuff in there that is kind of interesting. They then go and say this is the opposite. They use a different word there. They use the word antonym, which is actually also the wrong word to use there, but we'll, we'll let that one lie. The opposite of synchronous processing, which implies that the client only resumes its own execution once the server has processed the request. Now, as I say, there is a lot of things in the Reactive Manifest that's good. I don't agree with it necessarily wholly, so please take all of this with a pinch of salt. But look, it's, it's, it's good to kick something that's got a lot of attention, right? I feel like I'm at least punching sideways rather than punching down. Um, this is interesting, though, but this, for me, isn't necessarily about the distinction between synchronous and asynchronous. The client only resumes its own execution once the service has pr processed the request. This is about something different, more explicit, more discreet. And some of the tweets agreed. So originally Steve Smith uh, responded and he said that for him, uh, if he's thinking about synchronous versus asynchronous, he says a TCP connection is open for the duration of a communication. Now, I know Steve, he didn't mind that I was obviously going to poke holes in this. So I said, what, if I use quick or UDP, it doesn't count? I don't know the answer to this. Of course, the answer is, mm. Um, and he said, no, he clarified what he meant, which is, I assume you're not blocking for a response. So this is getting more specific. This lines up with what we just saw in the reactive manifesto. So for, for Steve, and for at least one aspect of what the reactive manifesto authors mean by asynchronous, they mean not blocking for a response. So this is interesting. And this, I think, is worth discuss discussing and exploring. So let's talk a little bit about what non-blocking means. So here's a simple scenario. I've got two services, loyalty and subscription, and I've got another microservice that needs to interact with them in some way. So one of the things we need to do is we need to award some points, and we also want to upgrade your subscription. Now, these things aren't, don't have to be ordered. They just both have to be done. From the point of view of the business process, these operations could happen in parallel or sequentially, kind of that's up, left up to us as a developer. Now, if we started implementing these, maybe let's, Im let's assume we're implementing these as sort of a direct HTTP call. So this could be using REST over HTTP, maybe we're using gRPC, which again is just going to be using the HTTP protocol under the hood. We might end up with some simple code that looks a bit like this. So I've got a line of code. So the first line of code here, I go loyalty service.award points. Okay, and I pass some parameters in. And REST1, that's the first response. So I'm going to execute that line of code, and I'm going to block and wait until I get response. Once I get that response, I'm then going to move on to the next line of code. And so that's when I'm going to make the next call to the service. So in this situation here, I'm calling you, and I'm waiting until you respond. No, he's nodded, he's nodded right? So now I go over to you, and I know what. You have to nod, otherwise I can't. Yes, not it. Thank you. So now I can carry on with my world, right? So this is sort of what we think of as blocking calls, right? Now, of course, we can start to see some of the issues with blocking calls like this. In this particular context, the latency of this operation is now becoming the sum of these downstream calls. So if the first call 
was taking, I don't know, 50 milliseconds, and the second call was taking 150 milliseconds, our total end-to-end -end latency is going to be at least 200 milliseconds this operation. And actually, you know, we, you know, one of the things we're often dealing with in the microservice architecture is trying to reduce the latency of our systems. And so we try and do things like avoiding long call chains. However, even if we don't have what looks like a long call chain, but have sequential calls from within a single service, we still have that latency buildup occurring because of a call happening, then a call happening, then a call happening. And this would be visible to you that this is going on if you're using, say, a distributed tracing tool. Big shout out to my friends at Honeycomb. Go see them on floor five, and they'll show you how you solve all these. We usually see all these problems occurring in your systems. So this is, this is not ideal. The other thing is it also gets a bit worse in a way, because we have to remember that the latency for an operation is not a fixed number. In fact, it's dangerous to talk about an average latency for an operation, in fact, because typically we would expect the latency for, say, a service call to have a distribution, and so it's more common to look at them in a histogram. You'll often see you know, calls with like, multiple peaks, which can occur when you're, doing, say, ca when you're having cash hits versus cash misses and the like. Um, and so you do get variability on this. And the issue is you then get sort of, you know, it could be as quick as 220 milliseconds in this case, or as slow as 70 milliseconds. We've got a range of how long any given operation might take. Now, if we're making multiple calls sequentially, we end up with a much, much larger range of potential durations for this operation than we might otherwise expect. And this is a problem. The more variability you have around operations latency, the harder it becomes to understand what the system is doing and whether or not it's healthy. If an operation could, could, be, could successfully complete and take anywhere from, say, 200 milliseconds to a second, it becomes quite difficult for you to spot when you've got issues occurring. Because sometimes it might complete at a second, and other times that might speak to a catastrophic issue you should have picked up earlier. So in general with distributed systems, we're aiming for consistent and more consistent behavior. Now, obviously, from a latency point of view, an improvement here would be to do these two calls in parallel. So that rather than doing one call and then the second call, instead, just to run them both at once and initiate both calls at the same time, and therefore, the overall latency of that, at least this part of our processing, should be bound by the slowest service rather than the sum of the latencies. So in this example, what I've done is I've just wrapped these calls effectively in a future. So for those who don't know, a future is a read-only type for basically a pending operation. It's a, sometimes you have direct access to a future construct in a, in a reactive extension library, and, and I quite like the concept of a future. So basically, when we create that future here, that's the first line of code here, we're not actually, the request is being kicked off in a background thread of execution, and all of that work is handled for us by whatever reactive extension we're using. So that first line of code, we're not blocking waiting. It's going to immediately return with a pointer to that pending operation. So now, the calls to loyalty and subscription are being done much more in parallel. These calls are no longer blocking. Seems good, right? This is an improvement. And you know, it, all of you will have libraries which will make it fairly trivial to do something like this around synchronous calls. If you've currently got synchronous blocking calls, Doing things like this to make them non-blocking isn't that difficult at all. Without, you don't have to change your communication protocol at all. The issue, of course, when we say, oh, we're not blocking, we're not blocking, it's not blocking, it's not blocking, but, but um, we, uh, we kind of do need the answers. So how do we get the answers in a situation like this? So we've constructed that future, and at this point here, we don't know whether or not those calls have completed in those background threads of execution. We certainly don't have the results of this operation. We may need the results. We may need to know that these things worked or didn't work, or we might see some of the return information to do something else or to return some information to the user or whatever else that might be. So how do we get the information? How, what would I need to do? I block, yeah, we block. So I do something like an await. I love it when people say, oh yeah, I've made my, I've made my interactions asynchronous by using an async await. Yeah, the await bit means you're blocking. It might be happening in a thread, but you're blocking. 
So this is, you know, oh, it's non-blocking, but, but blocking. But it's also non-blocking, but it's also blocking, though, isn't it? But it's also non-block, but it's also blocking. So this is a more specific term, but again, has confusion. Now, this isn't to mean that doing things like this is a waste of time. Absolutely not. Being able to do calls like this in parallel can have significant improvements to systems. There's another bonus of doing things like this. So, some of you, hands up who's heard of Moore's Law? Of course you've all got to put your hands up. Now, traditionally, when I first started in computing, uh, our, our kind of the, the outcome of Moore's Law, which states that transistor de density will double every 18 months, the outcome we saw of that was just ever-increasing clock speeds. So we could write a program, and that program would just magically get faster without us having to do any work year on year as chips got faster. Some time ago, chip manufacturers really found it more difficult to just increase clock speeds. And so instead, that increase in transistor density manifested itself in terms of us having more and more cores. The problem was our programs weren't necessarily built to take advantage of those cores. When we do things like this, the live, depending on the run times we're using, when we create those effectively background threads of execution to run those non-blocking calls behind the scenes, we give our runtime and the operating system the opportunity to make use of those additional cores. So sometimes this will actually grant you better throughput by making better use of the underlying hardware. So there's still good reasons to do it, but recognize that yeah, you still might need out blocking. You know? Even non-blocking calls may end up blocking. But it's still a good thing, right? I still don't think there's anything wrong with this. But we're still, you know, some people would say, okay, you're doing non-blocking calls, but you're still just sending, say, a HTTP request response flow, and I don't, think that's in, I don't think that's asynchronous at all. So let's go back to our Twitter thread, see what's happening in our Twitter thread. So here's the next one. This is from uh, uh, Graham Lee, uh, who used to be at Tyro in Australia. And uh, Graham starts off by saying, the definition that I've been using is the sending service doesn't wait for completion of the receiving service before continuing and or completing its own work. So there's part of this is about non-blocking, that first part. The second thing he says, though, which is, is where we're getting into another definition of what asynchronous means to some people, which he says, but, but now I think about it, I think I also expect a temporal decoupling from the receiving services availability. Now, at this point, I'll pause and say there's a lot of competing definitions of what temporal coupling, uh, decoupling means as well, but we can't get into that one because I've only got so much time. But we'll talk at least about what Graham means in this context in a moment. Another variation on this uh, comes from Benjamin, who says, synchronous communication, there's a direct communication between sender and receiver. Async communication, there's an intermediary involved between the sender and receiver. And both Graham and Benjamin are basically touching on this idea of decoupling of the client, you know, the temporally decoupling the client and server using some kind of intermediary, and typically by this we would often mean a message broker. Not exclusively, but this is what we often have. So the way to think about message brokers is as often called middleware. Rather than talking directly to the place you want to send a message to, instead you deliver that message to the broker and the broker takes it from there. So service A wants to send something to service B. It actually says, puts it, gives it to the broker. Says, here's the message. Can you make sure that B gets this when B is available? So if B is currently unreachable, the broker holds on to that message. Once B is available, that message gets delivered. It's a lovely, beautiful idea. So this is what Graham thinks of when he thinks of asynchronous communication. It's temporal decoupling, some kind of intermediary like a message broker. And effectively, what we're doing here is we're offloading this property of guaranteed delivery. We're going to the broker, and if once the broker gives us an acknowledgement, we are trusting the broker to ensure that message is delivered. Now, there's lots of different guarantees that you'll get from brokers. You need to look at your own documentation to find out what your broker means by guaranteed delivery. But again, we only have so much time. Another comment. Async communication you're like dropping snail mail in a red post box and then going on with your life. Then one day, boom, postman Pat stuffs something into your house mailbox along with millions of coupons and charity mailers. So I know a lot of people here are not from the United Kingdom and some of you are also young, so you might have a different version of who you think postman Pat is, but this is the OG postman Pat. 
not that idiot with the hovercraft, right? This is proper stop mation, OG postman Pat, and this was fantastic show, gritty, realistic show about a postman struggling with his life as a single parent of a cat delivering packages. He might have been married, I don't remember, right? This idea of the broker, the intermediary, like an inbox is kind of useful, right? So I'm out, someone comes and delivers post through the front door, it's in my letterbox when I get home. In the US, obviously, they have post boxes on the edge of the property because if you go onto the property, you'll get shot. So here we, that's why, but anyway, you get the idea though. I'm not at home right now and I know things have been delivered for me. I don't have to be there to receive the package. And that's great. And in a distributed system where one of the fundamental truths is sometimes the thing you want to talk to is not available, having something which can act as an inbox is incredibly useful especially if that inbox has good durability. And there's actually a bunch of different variations on this. You don't have to use a message broker. Um, you can actually use databases for this, although you probably shouldn't. Uh, for communication between services, file systems are incredibly common as well for doing this. I create a file, I drop it in a location, and another service picks that file up. You're using the file system there as a durable intermediary. We don't have any smarts around being told when the new file arrives, except for our ability to poll the file system. But again, that's something built into all the common libraries of languages I've ever used, well, in the last five years at least. We can even do this with email. This also should be filed in the, just because you can communicate between services using email, doesn't mean you should. Um, uh, email as a reliable message broker has a lot to be desired. The key thing here, is I don't need to worry about whether or not the recipient is currently available. It's a nice property. But we do need to trust that the intermediary is good, and isn't going to fall over. We have to put our faith in that, which means not just the people who wrote that broker, if you're using a message broker, but also the people that run it. This is why I always try to use a managed service, because people who run a managed services are always smarter than me. Um, but again, your mileage may vary. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that we traditionally see request response based communication through the synchronous light. But I mentioned that you could absolutely make request response asynchronous. And we've, some, so we've seen one version of asynchronous request response based communication just by making it non blocking, whatever that means. Uh, here's another variation on asynchronous request response when we think about using a broker. So, service A is going to send a, message, a request here to service B. We're going to ask service B to do something. And so I put it into a queue for, micro, for microservice B. B consumes the message, in this case the request, from that queue. I do some work. And I remember B is going to pick that up when it's ready. And when that work completes, it's going to put its response back on another queue. And back the response comes. There we go. Isn't that nice? This is asynchronous. This is asynchronous request response via a broker. Who knew? Kind of powerful. Works really well. The challenge, of course, well, this, what, what this does, though, is it does expose another interesting problem. The way most brokers work, it's not possible necessarily to guarantee that the response is going to come back to the same instance of a microservice that sent it. So far, I've mostly been showing an, a, you know, a very logical view of a microservice. But in reality, when we deploy a microservice, we have multiple instances, typically for baseline durability. Right? You don't get an SLA for machines on the cloud. Ergo, you want to have multiple copies of your microservice instances to tolerate those nodes dying. So I might have multiple instances of service A and, in fact, service B. So when I send that first request, to that queue, and B picks it up at some point. B does its processing, and it sends back the response. And that response goes back on the response queue. That response could go back to a different instance of that microservice. So we have to code A in such a way that it can handle that return value coming in and be able to effectively, if there is sort of a causal chain, pick up processing again. Effectively, this encourages us to make these things much more stateless. Now, if you build a system where you say, no, 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 the original instance that sends that request has to get the response back, the next question to ask about is why. Well, often the reason why is because you're holding on to state in memory, 
I've sent that request over a broker, and I need the response to come back here because I need to kick, carry on that processing, and I'm holding state in memory. So now I've got the complexity of somehow trying to effectively do session-based message routing, which is an added complexity. And then I ask the question, what happens when that machine dies? Oh, that's OK, you say, because I've used some kind of system for replicating in-memory state. And I'm like, what are you doing? This is not the way the world works. Just stop it. Just make your system work like this, and everybody's happier. It'll be more robust and more scalable, and you'll write code, which is much more stateless, and the world's happy. Unfortunately, the vendors are crying at this point, because there are lots of vendors that sell complicated software for doing in-memory replication of state. Now, to be fair, there are some problem programming problems where maintaining in-memory state across multiple requests is required. Um, sort of in-memory processing grids, uh, online shooters and other games online because of the latency is involved, absolutely. They represent probably less than 5% of the world's computing problems. You're likely not in that 5%. If you are, you know it. Okay, so keep your stuff stateless. We don't have that here. Coming back to our previous example, when I'm making those calls, I want you to do something. I want you to do something, and I'm waiting for you both to come back. So both the responses here could come back, but they're going to have to come back to the same instance. That's kind of implicitly what's happening here. I've opened the connection from my process to your process. It's coming back here. So we know the responses are coming back to the same instance. So then we should ask the question like, well, what happens when the consumer, i.e. the process running this code, dies halfway through? Well, we're going to lose those responses. They've gone. Bye. Hopefully, they weren't important. And hopefully, we can retry this operation. So just something to be aware of. What happens? We often think about what happens when, a, when, a, when the service we're talking to dies. But what happens when the client sending that request dies halfway through? Do we know how we're going to recover from that situation? I would also say this style of programming can often lead you to making more stateful type processing happening in your client code, which, again, has the problems I outlined before. But I think it's arguable that having an intermediary like a broker forces you to think about some of these issues and in turn encourages more stateless processing. So it could be a good thing, although we've now got the added complexity of a broker. So we've got lots of different definitions we've seen of what asynchronous means to some people. For some, it's about immediacy, the phone call versus email. For others, it's about temporal coupling, whatever that means. Others view it in terms of non-blocking, non and others think, oh, no, it's about a broker. And I'm like, what, are we, what is it again? Which one? And of course, then the next question you've got to ask is, does it matter? Right? Words have different meanings. Now, I suspect some of you might know this. Does anyone know the word in the English language with the most different meanings? Put your hand up if you know what it is. Go ahead. Set, set yeah, set. So in the 1987 edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, which is the most recent edition of the full Oxford English Dictionary, set has the most meaning. They think in the next edition, which is coming out, believe it or not, in 2037, I believe, it's a big book, it's actually multiple volumes, we think it's now going to be run. So set has only 430 meanings. Only 430 meanings. Run, they reckon at the moment, has about 645 different meanings. Now, of course, yes, we're talking about the tenses of these words as well, but, you know, there are, we are used to using languages that have lots of meanings, and English is no different. So, like, what's the big deal? We clearly deal with this. So here's the thing, right? When we get given a word and we see a word, the meaning of that word to us, how we derive that meaning, is about our own understanding it's about our own context. If I say the same word to two different people, they might think different things about it because of what just happened to them. If I said, what does run mean to you, and you've just been out for a jog, you might immediately be thinking of, well, run means running. You bring some personal context into it. One of the beauties of being at conferences like this is getting to have chats with interesting people. And on Tuesday, I had a nice chat with Ian Cooper. And many of us have a hinterland. Ian Cooper's hinterland is vast. And of course, it turns out he studied semiotics at university. Semiotics is the study of meaning, believe it or not. 
um, which yeah, I, I, it might be my next jam, I think. Anyway, and, he, and you know, paraphrasing something he said to me when I was talking through these ideas, he said, the meaning of a word becomes more narrow as we add other words around it. If I give you a word in isolation and give you no other words or explanation around it, the only meaning you can derive is your own personal meaning, but there's still a wide variety of different meanings you might take from it. As I add more words around that initial word, the definition, the meaning, becomes much more narrow. What's he talking about? Semiotics, you know. If you want to start dipping your toe into semiotics, I can thoroughly recommend watching Community, the, the sitcom, because you'll start getting a sense of how that works. Let's try it out. Let's think of the word run. So this run, I want you all to think of what run means to you. Picture it in your head. What does run mean to you? Okay, I don't need you to say it out loud. Now I'm going to put some words around it, and let's see if my meaning of the word run matches your word of the meaning run. The issue got worse the moment the program was run. Okay? So I put some words around it, and for many of you, the term run now means something a bit different to what you were originally thinking in your head. Let's try that again. The economy crashed due to a run on the banks. A different definition, a different meaning, rather, of the word run. The issue is when we're having conversations about technology and what's the right way to do things, we throw away round terms like asynchronous without anywhere near enough context to allow people to derive a shared meaning. Why is a shared meaning important? Well, because fundamentally software is a socio-technical system. This being a talk about meanings, let's derive, let's talk about what socio-technical means. Sounds like a very expensive management consultancy term, doesn't it? And indeed, if you hire my services, it can be. But let's talk about what socio-technical means. Socio-technical. Socio, people, humans, human beings being human people. And technical, we mean technology in the kind of the more broad sense of this term, being sort of complex knowledge. And now you're starting to say, oh, hang on, Sam, you're going to say that somehow like people are involved in writing software, like some kind of left-wing, guardian-reading, beardy, lefty, liberal, snowflake, wanker. And it's like, well, actually, no, the term socio-technical actually comes from a study into the efficiency of coal mining in World War II. So, no, this doesn't necessarily come from a bunch of... Oh, there's probably a bit of a healthy overlap between people studying coal mining and guardian readers. But anyway, you know, the term... It's been around for a while, this term, and we've now been, maybe in the last 10 years or so, been looking at this concept in the context of software, because we have to reflect and be honest with ourselves that the amount of useful software that's created by individuals is vanishingly rare. To the point where I'd say is it, it doesn't happen. You can think of individuals who may have started an influential project. The Linux kernel was written by a Linus. No, it wasn't. I bet you he's not the, he hasn't written most of that code. Software is created by teams of people, maybe not teams, but lots of people working together to create something. We have to bring groups of people together, and they have to be able to communicate effectively to build useful things. If you've got two people, and you start banding around terms like asynchronous, but you have different visions in your head about what these things mean, and you think that with these different definitions of a term like this, that you can come together and build a system successfully, Dang. things can go badly wrong. Now, we have some interesting stories that we can draw upon to see this problem firsthand. We have the story of the Tower of Babel from the Old Testament. And in the Tower of Babel, there were one people with one language. We never find out what the language is, but we can probably guess, right? And this one people, they're getting on really well. They're all using the same language, and they're building a beautiful city, and they're building a beautiful tower. And in the story, like the Old Testament God apparently goes, you know, oh, look, they're doing really well. There's nothing they couldn't do. Let's mess with them. And then he comes down, and he says, you've all got different languages now. And lo, the Tower of Babel doesn't end up getting built. Now, I always thought in the Old Testament there was some explanation for why the Old Testament God did this, but not really. It just seems that the Old Testament God, no matter what your beliefs are, the Old Testament God, a bit of a dick. So we know, like, this is, this is a thousands of years old story that speaks about the importance 
of people speaking and being able to communicate clearly to deliver interesting and powerful things. Coming back to our context, the term asynchronous in the context of inter-process communication has so many meanings that it is effectively meaningless if you use that word in isolation. And what I tend to find is as I put more words around the word asynchronous, I no longer need the word asynchronous in the first place. So what can we do with this? When you're thinking about the thing you're trying to build, understand what is it that my application needs. Talk about how it should handle different situations. Talk about its desirable characteristics. And get specific as possible about the general ways you expect it to handle certain common situations. What should happen when a server is unreachable? How are you going to handle that? How fast do you want it to be? Putting numbers around things is always good, I find. What should you do if the client crashes? And use and develop more explicit terms, even if it means locally coming up with your own internal terms to define things, to make things more clear. Uh, an old colleague of mine, Nat Price, has a great talk about how event storming was almost a disaster at the company where he worked. And that's because, partly because there are lots of different people coming in with different contexts, and they all had a different meaning of what the word event meant. For some, event was something in an event source system. For others, event was about communication between things. And it ended up being a giant mess. And so they ended up actually having to use terms like historic fact to distinguish between different usages of these things. So maybe you want to come up with your own internal terms, which are more specific within your context. Say things like, clients should, where possible, be non-blocking. You should try and run operations in parallel, but we're going to give you the visibility to see when things could run in parallel. Again, go talk to Honeycomb on floor five. Tell them Sam sent you. I get no commission. Or we are going to use broker X as an intermediary so that we can do X, Y, Z. Be more specific. But don't try and use this as a way to gatekeep language or make it about a power play about correcting other people. So in The Princess Bride, and this is a bit of a, I haven't quite used this as a way it should be used in a way, because it, obviously in the film, which you should all watch because it's a brilliant film, we have this situation where Vinicus is running around saying inconceivable a lot. And the joke, of course, in the film is that we all kind of do know what inconceivable means, and Vinicus is clearly not using it correctly. Right? And so this is, this is what the conversation is about. You keep using that word. I do not think you, it means what you think it means. And he's being polite here, but in a way that it's like, yeah, you are kind of wrong. Don't, if you're trying to have conversations with your colleagues about the terms and the words they use, I mean, I think Ingo and Montoya is doing it fairly well. And there's something irresistible about Mandy, isn't it? But anyway, you, you can afford to ask a, a, a variation on this. So next time someone says, we should make this asynchronous, maybe just ask, what does that mean to you? And you might be surprised. OK, that's me. We've got time for questions. I have a book. Please buy my book. I have a child to support. Um, and uh, if you want more information about the work I do, it's over on my website. I'll get the slides for this talk up on my website once I can get the website rebuilt. And I'll uh, send around a tweet. I'm also over, I'm just Sam Newman at Hacky Derm over on Mastodon as well. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. If you aren't going to hang, well, as you leave, please do vote. But we do have time for some questions, if anyone has a question for me. Go ahead. So the question was, did anyone mention asynchronous implying out-of-order communication? I'll be honest with you, that thread was 18 months ago. I don't recall that being the answer, or being a thing. I mean, out-of-order communication is often something you have to deal with face-to-face -face when working with intermediaries, so within, within brokers. Now, some message brokers will order things for you. Sort of what you might class as, say, traditional message brokers like RabbitMQ and things, you will get guaranteed ordering within the queue. Um, within Kafka, you only get that within partitions. So different intermediaries are able to give you ordering or not. So I think that's probably not... Um, it's not something I would take away in the context of asynchronous. However, it's something I would be worried about depending on what I'm using for communication, because some communication will off one. If you read from two Kafka partitions, you're going to get stuff out of order. That's just, that's just life. <laughs>
So it's more something you have to be aware of around specific technology, if that makes sense. Another question. Any other questions for me? Now, what's going to happen is you're going to say there's no questions, and then you're all going to come running up and ask me questions afterwards. So go ahead. So the, the chap in the ACA.net t-shirt suggested that we use actors. Now, I'm, I'm poking fun, right? right? It's a lot of work. I mean, ACA is a, is a, you know, ACA.net is a big undertaking. Um, I don't think that you, now you've got to define what actors are. So you haven't changed the problem. My, problem my, my question here wasn't about should we be synchronous or asynchronous. My conversation was here about talking about the properties you want. And the actor model, there's actor model inside a process boundary. And then there's actor model across a process boundary. And those are very, very different things. So I've seen people using the actor-based model, and they think about it just as passing. I'm just basically calling methods on an object. That's what it feels like. When you get a nice abstraction like ACA gives you, you don't really realize you're doing anything special. Right? I'm just calling methods on another object. And then people start distributing their actor-based systems. And they start making fine-grained calls between those things. And I know that's not the goal of those sort of systems. I don't think that solves problems. That just says, Pick my term rather than somebody else's term. To be fair, at least there is a bit more terminology around the concept of what actors mean. Um, but, yeah. Go talk to chat about ACA.net if you want to know more about it. What else we got? We've got a question over there in the middle. <laughs> well, depends, you know. I wasn't sitting there waiting. Yeah? Um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. That would be a form of asynchronous. I'm, I'm waiting around. I'm not waiting around for that person to operate. However, if I was writing an article or doing a presentation that needed the answers, I would have to wait till I got enough answers to write the presentation. And I put that tweet out 18 months ago, and 18 months later, here the talk is. So maybe not for the individual tweets, but I kind of did have to, at some point, block and wait till I had enough information to do the talk. Wow, that's quite clever. Good question, though. I like the question. That's, a, that's an awesome one. Thank you. Um, what else we got? Who else got a question for me? Now, I've got a question for you. Hands up if you're doing asynchronous communication between your processes based on the conversation you just had. So you're still very certain, very sure of yourselves, aren't you? Later on, go chat to someone else. Right, well, exactly, there you go. That's the right answer. Yeah, yeah. But afterwards, go maybe chat to someone else doing asynchronous communication. There's some people with their hands up there and ask them what they do. And, you know, what you find might shock you as well. Um, but, yeah, just be clearer. Any other questions at all about any of these things? I promise I won't poke fun. Go ahead. Have you talked more between precision and techno babble? Yes, good question. So how do you draw the line between precision and techno babble? And it's sort of interesting because some of the things you can... When you do have terms in a complex domain like ours that can have different meanings, sometimes what we do is we bring a new word in to try and give it more specific meaning. This, though, then unfortunately just increases the vocabulary that you have for a particular domain. So, OK, we're not going to use the term eventually consistent. We're now going to say eventually convergent. I've now got to explain what convergence means. I, I, honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I kind of, it's also a bit unfair for me it's because most of my job is often helping to educate people about what these terms mean, and I'm not sure of the answer. Um, I think what it helps is to often try and get feedback from people that are not as in the domain as you are yourself. So, you know, when I write the book, for example, I would purposely go out and get people that don't know microservices that well but do know computing, and they'd go, what's this mean? What's that mean? What's this mean? I think that's all you can do. If you're, a if you're somebody inside an organization, for example, who is there to communicate on ideas or share about ideas, you're a technical leader, for example, I think it's important that you actually go out and chat one-on-one -on -one with people and use these terms and get feedback on them and tune what you're saying and how you're saying it. A lot of the time, I will go to presentations about topics that I already know really, really well. And I nearly always come out of them with some other way to express ideas in a better way than I could. Honestly, a lot of it's just, I think, just practice and triangulation. And triangulating with your audience. 
but it's knowing your audience as well. So I've done like a couple of lectures and things like on a master's program, and you go in and you have conversations there. These are people that have never worked in industry before, so you have to triangulate your language. However, they probably know more about consensus algorithms than I ever will. I, don't, I can't break it to them that, yes, they might be able to tell me how Raft works, but their day job is probably going to involve taking data out of a database and putting it on a screen and maybe taking that data off a screen and putting it back in the database. But you triangulate your, your meanings, I think, based on the audience. All you can do, I think that's all you can do. Or study semiotics. But I, I, don't, I don't have the time for that right now. I'm going to, though. I will, I will look, it up on the, I'll look it up on Wikipedia. That'll probably be enough. It's tough. But you're right, it's absolutely it's tough. Go ahead, question. Yes, yeah, so, so to, to, around my terminology, when I, when I talk about um, request response, if I wanted to send a request to multiple people, I would just send it to multiple people. With an event, when I, so if you think you're a service and you, you post something up on a notice board, you don't necessarily know who's going to look at that. It could be multiple different people could come and look at it. The terminology I tend to use is I talk about request and response for request response interaction and the event in the event driven interaction. But yeah, if actually events fit really nicely in any situation where you've got kind of a multicast. You often don't want multicast request because if you think about the nature of APIs, I'm not going to go and make the same API call on 10 different microservices because those 10 different microservices are doing different things. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of how, so to just do typically, most multicast situations tend to be more event driven. I hope that kind of makes sense there. Any other questions? Question right there at the back. Well, uh, yes and no, because again, they're using the term asynchronous in probably a, an acceptable context. The person who wrote those libraries was thinking about asynchronous in the context of a single running process. So we then take that term of asynchronous, which is that narrow confines, makes sense, and then we use it to wrap calls on other service. So, so we're almost overlapping those contexts. So I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, it's weird because I did actually go back searching into all the prior art of where people use terms like asynchronous and things. I looked at Tannenbaum, for example. Tannenbaum only uses the term 11 times in the whole distributed systems book. So I think he looked at that term and went, nope. Um, but the reactive extension stuff, I mean, there, there might be, a, and, and, and actually what Pat Helen does in his original article is he said, look, the term consistency in ACID has that concept of an ACID transaction has been around a lot longer than us talking about eventual consistency. So his proposal was, we let that prior art word remain, and we come up with a new term, a new word. Um, so I, I, don't think it, I don't think we can blame the people who write the library, because they were writing it in one context, and we're using it in another context. But we can afford to make that less confusing. There's no reasons why you can't take a library like that and wrap your own abstraction around it that for your context uses better, clearer language so that for your own developers, you add meaning. I think that's probably, probably the best we can hope for. But yeah, we can also blame people that did loads of hard work as well, because that's always fun. Sorry, reactive manifesto authors. Any other, I thought we've got well, time for one more question. Go ahead. Yeah, so the, the, the comment was, so in the context of, say, a document or a presentation, you can take the time to build up sufficient context around these concepts that they have better meaning. How do we do that in code? Um, I mean, some, I mean, a lot of it, I mean, part of this is a lot of what we use refactoring for is to try and rename things to give them more meaning. I, don't, I think there is this idea, though, that we can just jump into a code base and that's going to be enough, and that's going to be sufficient. And I don't think that's true. So hypothetically, let's imagine you worked at some kind of, I don't know, newspaper. Right, 
and you jump into a code base based on that, and you start to see words and you start to see terms being used in that context, you might get some understanding about what that means, but you might actually also need to go and ask a reporter or an editor what those terms mean as well. I don't think we can, we can have a piece of code perfectly communicate both a technical context and a domain context where we assume that no other information is being given. I think all we can assume is that you know, misunderstandings will arise from that. I think good code that's using, say, ubiquitous language of your domain can actually make the communication outside of that code much easier. When I do read that documentation, I do speak to that business stakeholder, they use the same words that are in my code, I think that's, that makes the whole thing work together. But again, I don't think you can look at the code just in isolation. It wants to reinforce that context, not contradict it. When it contradicts it, that's when things get really bad. That's when techies and business people don't talk to each other. All right, I think we're probably going to call it on time. I'm happy to hang out and ask more questions, but I know some of you need to go get coffee and everything else, and I think we've got a fairly tight turnaround for the next session. So I'm going to start packing up. We've got to, I've got to do a very quick thing for my, my, my very talented colleague over here. Um, so I've probably got time for a, You might have to hang around while I do a quick video, but then I'm happy to ask and answer questions. But thank you so much for your time. <laughs>